A patron let me know about this Wired video, Nutritionist Answers Health Questions from Twitter. The nutritionist is Dr. David Katz. He has promoted a plant-heavy diet for years now. As this patron says, it's mostly a nice video, but he said some stuff which I thought was questionable, especially coming from a professional. Having watched the video, yeah, I agree. Most of what he says is correct, and he says it in an easy to understand way. I think he's a really good communicator. But when asked about protein, if it's possible to get too much protein, his answer is just bad. Yes, you can eat too much protein. Most Americans get about twice the recommended amount of protein. Excess protein is acidic. Excess protein can't be used by the body, doesn't turn into big, strong muscles. The body can store carbohydrate and it can store fat. It cannot store protein. Our carbohydrate store is called glycogen generally about 1,200 to 1,800 calories worth. Protein does not get stored. So what the body does is convert it into something it can store. And since glycogen is already capped out, all surplus protein the body doesn't need and can't use now, it stores as fat. And then at the end, they include this like fake tweet, I guess, about excess protein taking minerals out of our skeleton, weakening our bones, causing stress on our kidneys and liver. Presumably this is from him, given he has said basically the same thing elsewhere, that protein can be bad for our liver, kidneys, bones. Yes, you can eat too much protein. Of course, just like carbs and fat, protein has calories and eating more calories than we burn, whether it's from carbs or fat or protein, leads to weight gain. And generally, weight gain is unhealthy. Plus, for many people, many Americans, protein means animal products, and we really don't want to be eating a lot of those. But this doesn't seem to be what Katz is talking about, given his next sentence, the follow-up statement about RDA. Most Americans get about twice the recommended amount of protein. So excessive to him seems to be more than what's recommended, more than the RDA. That is excessive and bad for us, which is strange considering the RDA does not suggest optimal intake. It was created to avoid malnutrition. So 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of adult body weight, that is the RDA for protein, is the minimum amount we should be getting, sedentary adults should be getting. And this minimum is based on dated nitrogen balance studies. A better method, the indicator amino acid oxidation technique, suggests a minimum of 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram for most sedentary adults. So for example, that would be up from 51 grams of protein to 76 grams of protein for a 140 pound adult person. Further evidence that the current RDA for protein is not sufficient comes from a randomized controlled trial that confined healthy sedentary adults to a metabolic ward for eight weeks. They split the participants into three groups. Each group was eating 40% more calories than they needed, but they were getting different amounts of protein. So one group was eating around the RDA, so 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Another group was getting 1.8 grams, and the final group was getting three grams. They found that while the group eating around the RDA for protein lost a tiny bit of lean mass, the other two groups eating significantly more protein actually increased their lean body mass. Excess protein can't be used by the body, doesn't turn into big, strong muscles. True, you're not just going to get big, strong muscles by eating a lot of protein. You have to apply a, a stimulus. You have to resistance train. And even if you do train, even if you lift a really heavy weight, there is a limit to how much protein can help you. At some point, more protein is redundant. But again, that's not what Katz is talking about. He's talking about just above the RDA. That is excessive. No. In fact, it's recommended to go pretty far above the RDA if you want to maximize muscle gain. Somewhere between 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, with the average possibly being around 1.6 grams. So that would be up from 51 grams to 102 grams for that 140 pound person. Now, being healthy isn't really about gaining muscle. We want some amount of muscle, yes, and everyone should do resistance training, particularly as we age but looking like this is not required for health and arguably hinders health. But again, even sedentary people seem to benefit from more protein. Excess protein is acidic. And this is where I just, I died. I don't, I rewatched this so many times. Maybe he said something different, but no, the, it's, it's the acid ash hypothesis in 2023 from an MD. 
So the acid ash hypothesis claims that acidic diets are harmful, namely by leaching calcium from our bones as a way to buffer that acid. It's the underpinning of the alkaline diet, along with the belief that diet can actually change your blood pH, and our blood pH is slightly alkaline, so you want to eat alkaline foods. Vegans have also gravitated towards this, the acid ash hypothesis. Not too surprising, considering many of the acidic foods are animal products, meat, cheese, eggs, and it was seemingly an easy counter to vegans can't get enough calcium, a common claim, right? You could say, well, actually, vegans need less calcium because we're not eating all the acidic animal products that cause us to leach calcium from our bones. And to be fair, there was some evidence supporting this hypothesis. Studies finding that acid-forming diets correlated to more calcium in the urine and that the calcium seemed to come from the bones. And this hypothesis seemed to make sense in light of the calcium paradox, where countries with lower calcium intake, lower dairy intake, seem to have lower risk for hip fractures. They also eat less animal products in general. So acid ash hypothesis, the less acidity means they need less calcium because their body doesn't have to leach the calcium from their bones to deal with the acidity. It's a lot of hand movements. <laughs> that was the idea, but the evidence we have today and that we've had for many years does not support this hypothesis. While an increase in urinary acidity has been correlated with an increase in urinary calcium excretion, dietary changes that increase urinary acidity do not lower body calcium balance. It seems that yes, more protein will lead to an increase in calcium in the urine, calcium excretion, but then the body compensates for that by increasing calcium absorption by about the same amount. This systematic review and meta-analysis concluded a casual association between dietary acid load and osteoporotic bone disease is not supported by evidence, and there is no evidence that an alkaline diet is protective of bone health. And meta-analyses have found either no relationship between protein intake and hip fracture risk, or they have actually found it to be protective. More protein seems to reduce the fracture risk. Again, we've known this for a long time, even little old me, little YouTubers with no background in nutrition. I have talked about this for years on this channel. Here's the Vegan RD's Calcium Primer from 2019, where she says it has not held up to scientific scrutiny, and she cautions vegans against thinking they need less calcium. That meta-analysis on acid load? It was published in 2011. To hear excess protein is acidic and bad for our bones, in 2023 from a mostly respected academic, an MD, a former Yale instructor. Maybe he just doesn't keep himself up to date on protein research, which is pretty hard to believe considering he's lead author on a study on protein, on how to measure protein quality. Maybe he's privy to evidence no one else has. Now, to be fair, he doesn't say in this video explicitly that it is the acidic nature of protein that is bad for our bones, so maybe it's something else, something else wrong with protein. Well, again, the evidence does not support that. Studies find either no association between protein and bone health or that it may have a protective effect on bone mineral density. There is a lack of evidence indicating that higher protein diets are associated with lower bone mineral density. What about the kidneys? While it is true that the kidneys can be overburdened by too much protein, too much protein in this context is really malnutrition. It's called protein poisoning, and it's when the diet is almost exclusively protein, so it's a deficiency of carbs and fat. But nobody promotes that. That's not what people mean when they say high-protein diet. The high-protein diets actually being promoted don't appear to affect kidney health. Obviously, if you have kidney disease and you've been put on a low-protein diet by your doctor, do what your doctor says, right? Follow that diet. But for the average healthy person, higher protein diets don't seem to be an issue. Same can be said for the liver. Protein poisoning? Yeah, not great for your liver. A typical high protein diet seems fine. There seems to be no downside to eating more protein and lots of benefits, not just when it comes to lean body mass, but satiation as well. Obviously, there are downsides to eating certain protein-rich foods, but those downsides are due to other factors, not the protein itself. There's no evidence that getting 100 grams of protein a day from chickpeas and pinto beans and soy and peanut butter and whole grains is bad for us. 
Dr. David Katz has an interesting history with the food industry. He has been paid quite a bit of money over the years from various food companies. In some cases, he has gone on to promote products from those companies without disclosing his relationship with those companies. He has defended some of those companies in court. For example, he was an expert witness for Chobani yogurt, arguing that their use of evaporated cane juice in lieu of sugar was fine, that it wasn't deceptive. He defends this by saying everyone knows what cane sugar is, so it's not deceptive, and other companies do the same thing. They also list evaporated cane juice on their labels. Okay, sure, but in essence, he was paid a lot of money to defend sugar, basically. He also helped create Nuval, a nutrition rating service. It's an inherent potential conflict of interest that Dr. Katz takes hundreds of thousands of dollars from food companies with high sugar products, such as Hershey's, Quaker Oats, the Western Sugar Association, and the Coca-Cola Company, while also selling a supermarket rating system that makes recommendations about what to eat. Apparently, Nuval ranked some processed foods higher than canned fruits and vegetables. And Nuval developer Leonard Epstein said he disagreed with several of Kat's decisions and he would have done things differently. Unrelated to public health, but seemingly indicative of Kat's character, Katz's character. He wrote a fiction book under a pseudonym and then wrote two separate reviews, positive reviews of that book, pretending that he was just a reader, <laughs> not disclosing that he wrote the book. Now, according to Katz, for reasons related mostly to the integrity of the tale, the author could not be me. So the book was written under a nom de plume. Attempting to preserve that separation between myself and the author, I soon realized that left me with no way to tell anyone interested in my writing about this book, which I honestly consider the best thing I've written. I decided to write a blog about it in the third person and express my opinion. As noted, the writing in question was not compensated. He then goes on to say it's not a big deal and the the only reason it's being talked about so much is because these people who don't agree with his dietary recommendations are using it to make him seem untrustworthy. Okay, probably true, but that's because it does make him seem untrustworthy, particularly in light of everything else. And it's just fucking weird. Like, who... Who does that? Now, really, none of this has anything to do with this video, the Wired video, and the answers to the questions. Those are either right or wrong, regardless of his backstory. But I know people would bring it up in the comments if I didn't mention his sordid history. So there you go. Yeah, he he's fucking weird and possibly a shill. But again, his dietary recommendations are mostly good. Now, it wouldn't be fair to point out his conflicts of interest without pointing out my own. Not really a conflict. I'm not paid by big protein. But I have promoted a high protein diet for years now. I have multiple videos saying that we should aim for higher than the RDA, particularly vegans. I have multiple videos criticizing vegan YouTubers for eating too little protein. I have an incentive to disagree with what Katz is saying, that high protein diets are bad for us. Not a monetary incentive, but a embarrassment one? I, like, it would suck for me to <laughs> have to say, oh, actually, I've been wrong this whole time and high protein diets are, are bad for us. Regardless of my bias, hopefully I've shown that high protein diets are probably good for us. They are probably beneficial for the vast majority of us. And I've done this by relying a lot on examine.com. I bring this up because they are basically the opposite of Dr. Katz. They are not tied to anyone. They have no conflicts of interest. They are totally independent, no sponsorships, no ads. They are one of my favorite sources for nutrition information. So that's it. He does say a couple other weird things. He said, I think he said about organic that it's pesticide free. Herbicide should not be part of the human diet. Pesticide should not be part of the human diet. Antibiotics dosed to animals should not be part of the human diet. And if you eat organic, you're avoiding all of those things. That's not, no, it's not. Um, but yeah, like I said, basically everything else is fine. And he is a really good communicator. It sucks that he's so off when it comes to protein. And again, his just weird 
past. But yeah, I would love to know your thoughts and thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and like the video. Thank you so much to my patrons at patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. I do post two exclusive videos there a month for $5 plus patrons. I already posted the controversial-ish one for September. I have shirts as well. I actually do have the fuck alignment shirt up for those who are interested. I have it in the uh, women's style that I like and then also in a unisex style. So check that out. And I have my Amazon store page and that's it. Thanks guys. New video soon. Sorry I was gone so long. I think it was like 10 days between videos, which I try not to do anymore. I know in the past I would just go like two or three weeks without posting anything, but I've really been on a good schedule, you know, for the last year or so since I, I came back from having a little tiny baby who is now so huge. Point is, we got sick, our first cold of the school year, which we were expecting, of course, and it was really mild for me, uh, which was nice. Like my throat hurt a little bit, but I didn't get a runny nose and I didn't get congested or anything. My kids did. They're still dealing with like runny nose issue. I was really achy and tired for several days, but yeah, it was nice to not have the can't breathe thing. And then you use all these tissues and then it hurts. It's all raw because you've been wiping your nose so much. Oh man. And I'm going to get sick again, probably in just a few months. Hooray. <laughs> You know what's been fun? Ice cream cones. I have not had or had not had an ice cream cone in so long, like maybe just a couple times since I went vegan. Seriously, it's crazy. And then uh, I was out with four-year-old just doing my normal weekly shopping and they saw some, not the waffle cones, but the little like wafer ones. Those are my favorite. I really don't care for waffle cones. And they were like, what's that? They thought it was the whole like ice cream in the cone, right? Cause that's what they show in the box. And I was like, oh yeah, ice cream cones. I was like, wait, you haven't really had these, have you? And they were like, no. And then I had to explain, it's just the cone, right? That's not, the ice cream's not part of it. Oh, it's like, yeah, we add the ice cream later. I was like, okay, we'll get some. Well, <laughs> cut to me having an ice cream cone every night. <laughs> I'm using the So Delicious Vanilla Oat. It's the vanilla oat. Really, really good, delicious flavor. I love their vanilla-y stuff. It kind of has a little bit of that cocoa whip taste that I love um, and super vanilla bean-y, right? Um, it, the texture, it's a little chewy, a lot of gums in it, I guess, but uh, yeah, really yummy. So I put that in there and then I'm also using their chocolate chip. I think that's also oat, no. No, not the oat. I'm ridiculous. It's their uh, Wonder Milk, the Wonder Milk one. Those are both the Wonder Milk, which I think uh, definitely one of the best in terms of like not Brave Robot, <laughs> in terms of uh, plant, you know, using plant ingredients, vegan ice creams. And then the third one is also so delicious, but that one is their oat. And it's the coffee, coffee one, the coffee chocolate chip one. Oh, I love so I put all three of those, like a scoop of each basically, which sounds like a lot, but it's like maybe a serving total. Cause it's just one, one little scoop with an ice cream scoop, like a little one, not, not a huge ice cream scoop, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I felt the need to share that. It was just, it's just really fun having, <laughs> having an ice cream cone. <laughs> I feel like I'm lying. I had a little thing in my hair back here because there was a hair like sticking out. Is it still sticking out? I can't see for shit. Camera's too far away, but it's like sticking out. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> so I put it back with a little clippy. I don't know. It feels like I'm lying. That's stupid. That's psychotic. It feels very weird because I just had this clip with like a few little hairs pinned back. What does that look like from the back? Can you see? Looks cool. <laughs>